Lao Tzu puts it in this way, the great Tao flows everywhere, both to the left and to the right. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And when merits are accomplished, it lays no claim to them. The more, therefore, you relinquish power, trust others, the more powerful you become, but in such a way that instead of having to lie awake nights controlling everything, you do it beautifully by trusting the job to everyone else. And they carry it on for you. So you can go to sleep at night and trust your nervous system to wake you up in the morning. You can even tell it, I want to wake up at six o'clock and it will wake you up just like an alarm clock. This seems a sort of paradox to say this, but the principle of unity, of coming to a sense of, of oneness with the whole of the rest of the universe, is not to try to be, obtain power over the rest of the universe. That will only disturb it and uh, antagonize it and make it seem less one with you than ever. The way to become one with the universe is to trust it as another, as you would another, and say, let's see what you're going to do. But in doing that, you see, in saying that to everything else that you have been taught to think is not you, you are also saying it to yourself. Because finally, as I pointed out, you do not know where your decisions come from. So when we decide, we're always worrying, did I think this over long enough? Did I take enough data into consideration? And if you think it through, you find you never could take enough data into consideration. The data for a decision in any given situation is infinite. So what you do is, you go through the motions of thinking out what you will do about this. And then when the time comes to act, you make a snap judgment. I mean, I'm speaking a little extremely, uh, making some fun of it and uh, so on, because after all, uh, we, we do occasionally get the vague outlines of things and make a right decision on rational grounds. But we fortunately forget the variables that could have interfered with this coming out right. It's amazing how often it works. But warriors are people who think of all the variables beyond their control and what might happen. So then when you make a decision, and it works out all right, I think very little of it has much to do with your conscious intent and control. But somehow or other, you are able to decide and control things more harmoniously if you delegate authority. That's why very great businessmen are those who can delegate authority. Trust others to work for them. Because those are people developing businesses on the same basic structure that is fundamental to a living organism. Delegation of authority. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And you see, then, what is happening is this. The more you let go of it and trust it, as if it were quite other than you. The more you realize 
the inseparable identity of self and other. To go back, if you try to find the identity of self and other by subjecting other to self, no go. If, on the other hand, you, you find it through giving self, that is control, over to other and trusting that, you may make a mistake. You may make a bad gamble. But in the long run, you're acting on a principle which has the backing of evolution. This is the way biological evolution goes on. Constant delegation of authority. That's why, obviously, the democracy is superior to the monarchy. It was de Tocqueville who said that democracy is always right, but for the wrong reasons. Because there is operating in a democracy the principle that Buckminster Fuller calls synergy. And synergy is the intelligence of a highly complex system, the nature of which is always unknown to the individual members. Because that goes back again to this point, that we are always entering a new environment. We don't ever know fully what the new environment is, because the only environments we know are the past ones. There is always then operating in uh, the development of cellular life on any level, a new way of organization, higher than any existing form, <laughs> And we are not aware of it until after it's happened. So we do come out of this uh, way of, of thinking to something which has, I, I would say, the most enormously creative and revolutionary social consequences. that it has become not virtuous, not self-sacrificing, not anything like that. It has become the hardest practical politics to let go control to others, to give up trying to dominate the scene. Also, in a parallel way, it has become at this time in our history very much hard practical politics. To learn how to enjoy ourselves. You can go to the Protestant people with their Protestant ethic who uh, are against this kind of thing and now say to them with great glee, it is your solemn duty to learn how to enjoy yourself. Why? Because in an age of leisure, people have really got to know how to enjoy themselves. Because if they don't, they'll smash the whole future of the human race. So a utopia has become uh, not some sort of a dream, but an urgent necessity. We can't do without it. <laughs> because if we try to do without it, what's going to happen is that we are going to terminate our race in a mutual massacre of scapegoats. And so the, the present paranoia in the United States that is going on where everybody is thinking up a new scapegoat and how great it will be to demolish them or get them out of power. All, all this kind of bickering and uh, right and left politics has become irrelevant because we now have the opportunity of uh, trusting 
our own intelligence, our own technology. To take the risk of doing what we want, which will work to the extent that we realize that what I want, basically, what I really want is what you want. And I don't know what you want. Surprise me. But that's my, that's the kinship between I and thou. So when I ask, I go right down to the question, which we started with. What do I want? The answer is, I don't know. When Bodhidharma was asked, who are you? Which is another form of the same question. He said, I don't know. Planting flowers to which the butterflies come. Bodhidharma says, I know not. I don't know what I want. Well, when you don't know what you want, you've re reached the state of desirelessness. When you really don't know, you see, there's a, there's a beginning stage of not knowing and there's an ending stage of not knowing. In the beginning stage, you don't know what you want because you haven't thought about it or you've only thought superficially. And then when you, somebody forces you to think about it and go through and say, yeah, I think I'd like this, I think I'd like that, I think I'd like the other, there's the middle stage. And then you get beyond that. Say, is that what I really want? In the end you say, no, I don't think that's it. <laughs> I might be satisfied with it for a while and I wouldn't turn my nose up at it. But it's not really what I want. Why don't you really know what you want? Two reasons that you don't really know what you want. Number one, you have it. Number two, you don't know yourself because you never can. The Godhead is never an object of its own knowledge. Just as a knife doesn't cut itself, fire doesn't burn itself, light doesn't illumine itself. It's always an endless mystery to itself. I don't know. And this I don't know, uttered in the infinite interior of the spirit, this I don't know, is the same thing as I love, I let go, I don't try to force or control. It's the same thing as humility. If you think that you understand Brahman, you do not understand. And you have yet to be instructed further. If you know that you do not understand, then you truly understand. For the Brahman is unknown to those who know it, and known to those who know it not. And the principle is that any time you, as it were, voluntarily let up control in other words cease to cling to yourself <coughs> you have an access of power because you're wasting energy all the time in self-defense trying to manage things trying to force things to conform to your will the moment you stop doing that that wasted energy is available and therefore you are in that sense having that energy available, you are one with the divine principle. You have the energy. When you're trying, however, to act as if you were God, that is to say you don't trust anybody and you're the dictator and you have to keep everybody in line, you lose the divine energy. Because what you're doing is simply defending yourself. So then, the principle is, the more you give it away, the more it comes back. Now you say, I don't have the courage to give it away. I'm afraid.
And you can only overcome that by realizing you better give it away because there's no way of holding on to it. The meaning of the fact, you see, that everything is dissolving constantly, that we're all falling apart, we're all in a process of constant death, all falling apart, everything is. That's the, the great assistance to you. See, that, that fact that everything is in decay is your helper. That is allowing you that you don't have to let go because there's nothing to hold on to. <laughs> it's achieved for you, in other words, by the process of nature. So once you see that uh, you just don't have a prayer, and it's all washed up, and that you will vanish and leave not a rack behind, and you really get with that, suddenly you find you have the power. This enormous access of energy. But it's not power that came to you because you grabbed it. It came in entirely the opposite way. And power that comes to you in that opposite way is power with which you can be trusted.